ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to yet another webinar of the Prague Center for uh, Middle East Relations. Uh, today's topic is uh, the Arab Spring uh, in North Africa, 10 years on. The ups and downs of political transformation in Tunisia, Egypt, and Algeria. So we'll be specifically focusing on those uh, three countries. We want, uh, we want you to get an update on the current state of political opposition and overall political stability of Tunisia. Uh, I can guess that we will also touch up on some uh, topics regarding economic stability and performance, as well as security, as all those uh, are interconnected, if not in your opening statements in, uh, in the discussion, uh, for sure. At the moment, we are on the eve of the uh, 10 year anniversary of the, of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, I think it's a great time to take this opportunity to assess the bumpy roads of democratic transitions, uh, as well as authoritarian turns uh, in some instances in the sad uh, North African countries. Moreover, and I know this is very difficult always, and everybody wants it, uh, it would be very nice to hear your predictions. What are their most likely pathways uh, of further political developments, of further security developments, of economic developments of the, of the set countries? Uh, today with us, we have uh, three amazing speakers that I am honestly proud of myself that I, that I managed to get. Uh, and thank you very much for participating. Uh, first of all, Teresa Ermanova, then uh, Karim Taha. Teresa will be speaking on Tunisia. Karim is going to be speaking on Egypt. And uh, Jessica, uh, Jessica Norti, she's going to be speaking uh, on the case of Algeria. Now, uh, let's give you a brief introduction of the speakers so uh, you uh, can actually believe me how distinguished and knowledgeable people we have here on this on this uh, on this webinar. Teresa is at the moment assistant professor at the Department of uh, Middle Eastern Studies at Charles University and research fellow with the Association of International Affairs. Uh, in her research, she was focusing on the intersection of the study of contemporary politics of the Middle East and North Africa and comparative politics scholarship. She was focusing specifically on democratization. Uh, and the question how political actors navigate the intricate period that begins when autocratic leaders are forced to give up their power. So as you can see exactly the person that we should listen to uh, on the topics we'll be discussing today. She's at the moment working on a book manuscript that explores processes of writing new constitution, uh, new constitutions actually after the, after the uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, she earned her PhD in comparative politics at the University of Warwick in 2019. Uh, Karim, uh, Karim Taha is deputy director of the Egyptian Front for Human Rights Affairs. He's Egyptian human rights defender who started his activism already in 2008 with the 6th April uh, youth movement. He was in prison actually three times uh, in 2010, 14, and 15, he was subjected during his detention to physical torture, and in 2015, uh, eventually sentenced to life imprisonment because of his activism. He fled from Egypt, and he sought refuge in the Czech Republic, where he currently lives as political refugee. Uh, in 2017, Karim succeeded in establishing uh, the Egyptian front for human rights here in the Czech Republic based in Brno, as we discussed a little bit before. Uh, this uh, front focuses on conducting research and uh, advocacy with international mechanisms. Jessica, our third speaker, uh, is a researcher at the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University, where she was also director of uh, postgraduate research uh, in 2000. 18 and 20. She worked uh, in Algeria since 2007, authored the book, Civil Society in Algeria, Activism, Identity and the Democratic Processes, uh, which was published in 2018. Uh, she's currently a principal investigator at the British Academy, funded Imagining the Future, Engaging Young People, 
on environmental challenges to create new and sustainable livelihoods uh, in Algeria. Uh, she's also a researcher on the Ferguson uh, Trust funded project, Youth Violence and Conflict Transformation, exploring mobilization into violence and the role of youth in peace building. Uh, I could go on because the, this list goes, uh, but uh, as you can, as you can uh, make a picture for yourself, uh, we have three very experienced distinguished, speaker, uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I would like to ask you to give your opening statements, uh, as we discussed before, around 15-20 minutes. Uh, and uh, we are going to start with uh, Teresa, please, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I'll try to keep it as short as I can and stop me if I, if I go for too, for too long. No um, worries. But, but I have the ambitious plan of, of trying to do three, uh, three things, uh, or sort of two things. So the first one is to evaluate uh, the, the, the reform progress uh, over the 10 years since the beginning of the uprising uh, in Tunisia or the revolution for dignity, as Tunisians call it, uh, mostly uh, at the end of, uh, well, uh, at the end of 2010. Um, up until today. So uh, that's, a, that's a long, long time, but I'll focus on two things. And the first one is changes in terms of putting in place democratic institutions and ensuring uh, civil, uh, civil rights and, and political rights and freedoms. Uh, and I also be looking at changes in terms of economic betterment. So in terms of economic situation in Tunisia. Um, and uh, I'll, and then I look at some of the problems that uh, actually uh, the the lack of change in those two two areas uh, has has created over time, and which uh, well I won't go into too much predictions, but those might be the sort of uh, some ideas of how things might look like in the in the near future. Uh, so, but to, to, to start with something to sort of situate the whole situation 10 years after the uprising, I should start probably with the uprising and I'm not going to bore you too much with the whole story, but I just want to, uh, want to say one important thing about uh, the origins of the Tunisian protests in 2010 and the demands that were made by, by the protesters, because that I think can help us to understand the situation as it is today and also understand um, how the difficulty in terms of progress or the lack of progress, especially in economic terms, is creating uh, a lot of frustration among, among the citizens, as we can see in the, in the recent protests that I will get to eventually, hopefully as well. Um, so I think it is important to know that, uh, that before Ben Ali uh, left, flee, flee to Saudi Arabia uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, January 2011, uh, the protests actually originated in the, in the interior of Tunisia, uh, which has been marginalized for, for a really long time. This goes back to, uh, well, even before the French protectorate. Um, and uh, those, those interior, it's not only the interior of the country, it's also some, uh, some of the, well, northwest regions uh, that, have, that, that face a lot of problems in terms especially of unemployment. Uh, and the unemployment and is high, especially among young people. There is a high level of poverty. Uh, and uh, lack of infrastructure, especially compared to uh, the coastal wealthier cities uh, such as Tunis, uh, where, where the ruling family or the ruling elites in general have been, uh, have been coming from. Um, and so the, the, the revolution in Tunisia has been driven very much by economic demands. Uh, and only later on uh, those the protests were joined by other constituencies, by middle class citizens, by students from other areas, lawyers, human rights activists, and so on, 
who brought with them also more, more emphasis on human rights and freedoms. Uh, but uh, I think the most important, uh, the most important call that the protesters were making was about uh, social justice uh, and the betterment of economic situation and fighting corruption. And I think this can be seen from from some of the uh, some of the slogans of the revolution, like uh, "employment is a right." You group of thieves, which was directed at uh, the Ben Ali's regime and especially his family and the family of his wife. Uh, and this is crucial because while we have seen some actually important improvements in terms of putting in place democratic institutions in Tunisia since 2010, there has been much less progress in terms of achieving those demands over those past 10 years. Um, so I'll start with the and, and facing the, or dealing with the marginalization of some of some of the regions part of the country. Uh, so I'll start with the uh, uh, with what is better, which is the <laughs> which is the, uh, the the building of democratic institutions, uh, where we have seen extensive progress since the since the revolution. Uh, and I think by most counts or my, by most. Uh, most uh, definitions that are based on the pro procedural understanding of democracy, which understands democracy as mainly free, fair, and competitive elections, underpinned by social, uh, sorry, underpinned by uh, by rights and freedoms. Uh, if we take most of those definitions, then Tunisia would be probably considered a democracy today. Uh, and there are some some important uh, areas of progress. Um, among those, what we've seen over the past years are regular elections that are really free, fair, and competitive. Uh, where uh, losers in the elections accept the results of of the election. And I think the U.S. election recently reminded us how important that is for functioning of a democracy. Um, and uh, so, so that's one thing, an important thing uh, connected to those elections is not only uh, that, that they're free and fair, but also that, that people have a real choice. And we have seen a number of new, new political parties being established and competing and getting, competing in elections and getting into parliament over the, over the past several elections. So, so that's clearly a progress. We have also seen uh, adoption of a, of a democratic constitution uh, that happened uh, in January 2014. And, uh, and that, that, that constitution really underpins uh, important rights and freedoms. And one of the important things that it does uh, in, is that uh, it, it puts a lot of emphasis on women rights and on uh, dealing with uh, with violence against women, for example. So it uh, it states that the, that the state should be active in demanding those rights. And one of the one of the achievements that we have seen uh, since then is that uh, so the, the constitution actually asks for parity in elected uh, institutions, in elected councils. And the result of this is that uh, the electoral law actually since 2011 have asked to um, have uh, made it a rule that every second candidate on party list should be, uh, or every other candidate on party list should be a woman, which may, uh, which means that there are I think 36% uh, of women right now in uh, Tunisian, Tunisia's parliament, which is actually more around 10% more than in the Czech current uh, lower chamber. Uh, so that's 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 actually good. Uh, but then there are also some issues uh, when we look, especially at at human rights and some rights and freedoms. Uh, so, so there, there are still some shortcomings that that remain in Tunisia. Some of them are related to women's rights. Uh, so, that still some shortcomings remain, especially so. So, women are still eligible for less uh, inheritance than men. Uh, and uh, another issue that is that homosexuality still remains a criminal offense. 
and we've seen recently in the recent protests that, that have been happening in Tunisia uh, during January and February that LGBT people have been particularly targeted by, by police abuse and harassment. Um, there are still some draconic laws like the law uh, 52, uh, which uh, criminalizes the use of cannabis. And uh, based on this law, especially young people have faced very long sentences. Uh, so recently, I think in January, a court in CAF uh, ruled a sentence of, of 30 years imprisonment for, uh, for free uh, uh, young people. Uh, another thing that is still an issue is the state of emergency. A state of emergency has been in place since 2015 because of terrorist attacks. And uh, this is for those who study Middle East politics uh, and maybe look at some other authoritarian regimes, uh, you would know that emergency laws have been quite a favorite uh, tool for dictators to use to, uh, to deal with the opponents and uh, and make it easier to arrest civilians. Uh, so that's that's what we've that's what we've been seeing. Uh, it's also easier to put uh, citizens in front of military courts, uh, and also it makes it easier to ban larger gatherings. So these are these are all uh, big issues. Uh, when it comes to the constitution itself, we still haven't seen uh, the foundation of the constitutional court, uh, although the constitution actually uh, uh, expects uh, that there would be a constitutional court. And right now there is a, there is a, a constitutional crisis happening in Tunisia as uh, the prime minister and the president cannot agree but uh, or not only them, but many other people cannot agree. But uh, the the president has the right to actually not uh, uh, not uh, designate uh, ministers that the prime minister has asked for or offered to president. Uh, and uh, of course, only constitutional court can can resolve this. Um, and one of the, the, the last thing that I will say about the shortcomings when it comes to the progress in terms of rights and freedoms is related uh, to the unreformed security forces and especially police. And it is something that the recent pro protests, which started uh, basically at the time of the 10 year anniversary or a day or two after of the of the uprising or the, the fall of uh, Ben Ali's uh, or the flight of Ben Ali from Tunisia in uh, 2011, uh, and and those protests really exposed a lot of a lot of troubles uh, with the police, which is becoming increasingly confident. Uh, and uh, what we have seen is uh, during and after the protest uh, was was a lot of arbitrary arrests, uh, taking people who participated in the protests from the streets, from their home. Uh, actually, there has been uh, over, I think, over in the in the just the first year, first two weeks after the after the protest began, in mid January, there ha there has been around uh, thousand six hundred cases of arrests, and those are uh, those including six hundred minors. So, uh, because a lot of young people participated in the protests, uh, and uh, yeah. So, so we've seen a lot of a lot of troubles coming from the behavior of the police, which actually hasn't been really condemned by the political elites either. Uh, so, so this is this remains a, a big issue. Um, I'm conscious. I'm conscious of the time, and I've been going on for for, for quite some time. Uh, but I'll but I'd like to now skip to uh, the changes, the progress, or actually uh -huh. lack of. No, no worries, Teresa. You still have five to ten minutes, so yeah. don't feel pressured. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, so now I was talking about the progress in terms of uh, building democratic institutions and rights and freedoms, and I said that the second thing that I will talk about is uh, the lack of progress, actually, that has been made in terms of the bettering of the economic situation of Tunisia citizens. Uh, which, as I said, was one of the primary motivating forces behind uh, the revolution 10 years ago. Um, 
so by most indicators, uh, Tunisia is doing the same or worse uh, in terms of the economic situation than before the, than before the revolution. Of course, this assessment is always difficult because we don't know how accurate the numbers that we got from from the Ben Ali regime, uh, how how accurate those numbers were. Uh, but uh, even when we compare with other countries uh, and we look at the numbers for unemployment, for example, which is at around 16, which was at 16% before the Corona crisis hit, uh, that's, that's rather high. And the trouble is that this is sometimes twice the national average uh, in the interior regions and twice the national average when we look just at the young people. So uh, those are the, uh, the most uh, the groups that suffer most from unemployment and it's very similar with, with poverty. Uh, in 2015 uh, the rate of poverty was at uh, 15 around 15 percent and again twice as much in some of the some of the regions. I think for 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 many of the uh, citizens who live in the interior interior of Tunisia this is really frustrating not only because you have very little uh, life prospects, but I think also because a lot of the Tunisia's wealth, so uh, resources that it has from phosphates, uh, but also agricultural production of uh, olives and dates, which are quite uh, quite important, and also uh, also resources or how how do you say it of water uh, in the country. So this is mostly located in the interior regions, uh, but it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily create as many employment opportunities as it could, because the ex this is this is the place where the extraction happens, uh, and with phosphate, this has uh, this has don't think implications for life of those people who live there. Uh, but then the the actual uh, production of stuff that you make out of those things happens, especially in the coastal town. So uh, that's where you get the rest of the uh, the employment opportunities. Um, so that's 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 another reason for, for frustration. Uh, and also another issue is that uh, with, along with this, the inflation has been has been quite high and has been mostly growing since the since the revolution, which means uh, the prices are becoming becoming higher, and uh, the government or the the different governments have been trying to deal with those issues. But uh, but the reforms that they put forward mostly hit uh, at the end those who are, who were already hit by the situation because it led to higher higher prices on on food staples and so on. Um, and last thing that I want to mention is uh, is corruption. Uh, which has been, you know, considered by protesters in 2011 as a huge problem, uh, and uh, and it is still considered a huge problem. And and many people actually consider corruption today even worse than than it was before the revolution. But of course, this is not an objective count; it's their perception. But it's clear that uh, that they feel that there has been lack of progress in in terms of fighting uh, corruption. And these issues that I that I talked about, they so the lack of progress, especially the lack of progress in terms of uh, the economic situation, and especially of some people, uh, have created uh, a lot of problems for Tunisia's democracy. That uh, you know we might we might be afraid that uh, this can cause even more troubles in the future, and uh, I think. Just, just when we look at how people, what people think about democracy, uh, it has changed over time, over the past ten years. So while democracy, while the belief that democracy is the best system that we have, even you know, considering its uh, its faults, uh, this belief was very high after the revolution. It was over seventy percent. Uh, now it dropped to uh, just a bit over forty percent so uh, that's that's a big uh, drop uh, we also see that uh, people continue to voice their discontent quite often in protests 
So protest occasions have been have been rising. The numbers of protest occasions have been rising over the past years since 2016, basically. And uh, the most recent protests started in 15, 15 January, and they mostly happened in uh, or they mostly occurred, especially at the beginning, in uh, poor neighborhoods, in so-called popular uh, neighbor neighborhoods. Uh, so. Um, and uh, they were mostly joined by young people, uh, and also they happen in the in some of the towns in the interior regions, but not only. Also in popular neighborhoods in in Tunis, Osfax, for example, so so big big cities. Uh, and again, we see we see slogans such as uh, "Revolution of the Hungry," "No more poverty," "No more no more marginalization." So again, these are very much uh, related to economic demands and economic situation. But we've also seen how the protest, uh, how, how sort of the core of the protest or the demands shifted slightly as we've seen uh, police violence and, and abuse. So increasingly protesters started uh, starting, started, um, uh, uh, started to turn against uh, against pro uh, police harassment in their in their slogans, um, while the political elite didn't really uh, didn't really comment on that much, unfortunately. Uh, another thing that we're seeing is that probably out of lack or frustration with the lack of opportunity of life prospects, uh, many people consider. In Tunisia, the the perilous, of course, journey uh, over over the sea uh, to Italy. Uh, so uh, efforts at F emigration have been quite uh, quite numerous. Um, we've also seen, and that's another another huge issue, and that's probably connected to uh, the the lowering belief that democracy works well. We've seen uh, that many people do not trust the established political parties and they are looking uh, they are looking elsewhere so either they you know they, they go to protest so they they do not try to channel uh, their demands through uh, the formal institutions but they rather decide to uh, to voice them through protest and sort of street politics because they feel like those political parties that are uh, there do not really address their problems uh, but also uh, what we see is a growing uh, is a growing popularity of different demagogic or populist candidates who often say they come from outside of the establishment, they are outsiders, they, uh, they claim that they speak for the people, but uh, for many of them actually this is not really the case. Uh, so they're often very much part of the establishment or the establishment post 2011. Interestingly, Abir Musi, who is now a very popular politician, uh, and if the elections, parliamentary elections, were held today, she would, uh, her party would probably win the elections. So she actually is not necessarily connected to the today's establishment, but she's linked to uh, the former ruling party, uh, the RCD, and. Uh, she actually questions the revolution uh, and offers stability and security, but of course, uh, uh, <laughs> democracy would probably go uh, go with it. Um, so, when we look at the car, uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, final remarks. Yeah. So, if we if we look at the at the situation ten years after the revolution. Even in the in the poster child of the Arab Spring, Tunisia, which is the only only country where democracy was established, we actually see much progress, but we also see still a lot of a lot of problems, and uh, those are not only linked to the economic situation, which which continues to be quite uh, quite quite bad, uh, but also I think the recent uh, recent protests. Uh, showed that there is the lack of progress and reform in some other crucial area, areas like police reform. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Uh, this is actually a very interesting uh, point you made about, uh, let's say, uh, populist or demagogic candidates seizing the opportunity. Uh, 
as I'm closely following Iraq, this uh, appeared to be the case uh, during the protest there as well. But anyways, this is not the today's topic. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Karim, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you today. Thanks so much for the invitation. As all of you know, I'm going to uh, talk about Egypt, uh, 25th of January revolution. I'm going to start my talk with a uh, question. Uh, did the 25th of January revolution fail uh, to answer this uh, uh, question? It's going to be through uh, two uh, relatively succeed model. I mean, here, Tunis and uh, Sudan. Uh, we have to put in our consideration that there is five uh, components to lead to this success and start a uh, democratic path. First uh, model is Tunis and first component is Egyptian uh, is uh, Tunisian army. It's a very professional army, uh, not politicized and ha doesn't have uh, a political ambition. And on the other hand, the former Ministry of Defense is civilian since the French uh, colonial, colonialism. Uh, second component is the, the labor union uh, in Tunis. It's a very unique model, and is, there, isn't, um, let's say, there isn't nothing like it in the region. Uh, played a vital role uh, during the French uh, uh, colonialism and also during the revolution and right now. Um, it has a literary stature in the Tunisian society and uh, also the leaders of the labor union uh, were able to keep the independence of this entity uh, for long, long time, and it has never went under uh, the security control, uh, as well as the branches of the Lebanese everywhere in, in Tunis. Uh, third component is the acceptance between the, 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 the leader of the revolution and the opposition and reforms as well. Uh, all of them working on uh, joint uh, cooperation to achieve a democratic uh, uh, transition. Uh, first component is um, the opposition realized the importance of establishing the Supreme Commission to achieve the goals of or the objectives of the revolution. Uh, five, uh, fourth com five component is the Muslim Brotherhood, Nahda movement is very um, pragmatic uh, uh, movement. It's totally different than everywhere in the region uh, because all the leader of Muslim Brotherhood in Tunis, all of them uh, graduated from France. They grew up almost, they spent their twenties in France. So they are more open-minded. They quite, they touch the leftists in, 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 in France. So um, I see that they are very unique. They know also how to, to leave the, the field um, when the condition happened in 2013, they left very flexibly. Yeah, they left the, the power uh, in a few uh, weeks without any problems. So this is a really unique model in, 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 in France. Uh, second model is uh, Sudan. And first component definitely is the Sudanian army. Uh, through my point of view, I see Sudan army is more like political party than regular army. Um, um, yeah, since almost 20 years from the, 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 the internal conflict and civil wars lead to massacres and also the secession of the south of Sudan, uh, makes like a uh, clue base of moral uh, standing. Uh, and also uh, we can say the, uh, the, 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 the Sudanian people are very politicized, uh, most uh, politicized people in the region. And also the, 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 the Sudanian party was able to keep their social roots for more than half century against uh, the dictatorships and three uh, military coup. Uh, we can say also all the, the, the Sudanian government wasn't able to dismantling the civil society in, uh, in, in Sudan. 
uh, especially the labor uh, unions uh, played a vital role during the uprising. Um, uh, another component, we can say that most of the Suriname people are not uh, uh, Educated, but are very cultured. Uh, I still I used to live in Sudan for three months after I left Egypt. I can say that they are very very uh, cultured. They love books. They love reading, and they are very politicized. They most of them are Marxists. I still remember when I got invitation to visit the communist uh, communist uh, party in, in in Sudan. I I shocked because uh, each of them started to introduce themselves. Uh, first one told me that he's uh, Marxist. Second one told me uh, he's Muslim Brotherhood. You know, they are sitting together and they were drinking uh, Arak, like a very uh, local drink, alcohol drink in Sudan. It was shocked for me. And he told me that um, Muslim Brotherhood here is not related anymore to the, to Egypt or the, uh, the, the, the biggest office of, uh, of uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, another component is um the regional and uh, and the international and the african uh, um, players they played very uh, actors they played very huge role during the tran democratic transition in in in, uh, in sudan for example um the democratic transition happened under uh, us umbrella uh, coordinated by mediation from dynamic, like dynamic mediation from Ethiopia, and it was really, it was really, really a uh, uh, good point from uh, from the Ethiopian, and also it's different with Egypt because Egyptian doesn't have like um, African identity. Oh, Egypt. Uh, Egypt didn't have, unfortunately, we didn't have any of 10 components, which I mentioned above. Um, Egypt historically, historically uh, 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 lacked uh, a union entity, um, uh, labor, uh, like uh, a, a union labor entity. Uh, it was during the Egyptian kingdom, but unfortunately, uh, after the military coup in, 19, in 1952, uh, the labor uh, union went under the security uh, control. Uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, no, uh, let's say uh, uh, and, uh, that before the revolution in Egypt, there was uh, many of the organizations and many of the social movement like Six of April Yusme, which is I belong to them. Uh, it was really strong, and we were able to mobilize the Egyptian people against the regime. But after the revolution as well, uh, th there was uh, a, a many, uh, several uh, uh, organization has been established and did great work, uh, plus the news platforms and increase of the uh, artists and culture uh, forums. Uh, but let me tell you where all of them now. Uh, Sex of Every Youth mov Movement, unfortunately, all of the leaders uh, went to the prison, and the rest of them in diaspora, like me. And uh, the organization, one by one, has been uh, shut down because the Egyptian uh, uh, Arm uh, Supreme, uh, Armed Force Supreme. Uh, 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 we can say that uh, attack them and started to create a cases like it's very famous case 173 uh, which now in like a foreign fund uh, still exists right now still under investigation right now after 10 years it's a very important card in the with the Egyptians over the negotiation table specifically with the American administrative uh, we, I, I can say during the revolution, uh, Six of Every Youth Movement was the most important component of the January uprising for uh, its ability to mobilize the popular crowd. Uh, also, they accuse us as a terrorist group, terrorism group, terrorist group, and also, uh, yeah, 
most of uh, our colleague uh, still in the prison right now. Uh, so this component, unfortunately, is totally dead now. Most of the Egyptian uh, organization based on Tunisia at the moment. Uh, let's make a short uh, comparing between Egypt and Sudan and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Tunis. Uh, Tunis didn't have any uh, regional influence, but Egypt has because of the geography, because of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, since 50 years ago, Egypt held this negotiation and tried to play uh, a dynamic mediation in this topic. Also with Europe, yeah, and the migration and, uh, and this stuff. Uh, let me tell you, because of this, because Egypt has a, a regional influence, um, how to say, the axis of the evil, I mean here Emirates and Saudi Arabia played a very dirty role against Egypt, against all of the uh, Arab Spring Revolution, specifically in Egypt, they paid a lot, a lot of, they found a lot, a lot of money to, uh, to, to, to stop this revolution somehow, because they were very afraid to export this revolution to the Arab Gulf region. Uh, I can say that the gap between the Islamist and uh, liberal in 2011 was a gap um, about the principles before the, the political and between uh, uh, who believe and uh, other doesn't believe uh, on the um, individual uh, freedom, between who give the priority to democratic mechanism over the principles of the democracy. I mean here the Muslim Brotherhood and the Egyptian army. Uh, I think now, um, briefly, you can answer the question why Egyptian revolution failed, why I'm here as a refugee in Czech Republic, why my, my colleague uh, has been in the prison at the moment, because we didn't have any of ten, these 10 components, because, and now we try to rebuild ourselves again, rebuild our front again, we try to have uh, understanding, acceptance with the reforms, and we are trying to make a cooperation with the European Union, with the US uh, administrative and the civil society in Europe and USA as well. Uh, we try to get to know more about more experiments uh, happen around us, like the Czech experiment is very uh, inspiration for us. Uh, um, uh, and also we did that in the next, if we are able to make transition justice will be on human rights agenda, not any ideology, because it's very easy for all the world to uh, cooperate with us on this agenda, not like if we are leftist or liberal or Islamist or any other ideology, it will be quite hard and we will not find acceptance from all the partners. Uh, so I'm waiting you to answer if the Egyptian revolution failed or success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Karim. Uh, we are going to get to that in the discussion, I'm sure. Uh, and thank you for sticking to the to the time limit as well. Uh, now I would like to give floor to uh, Jessica. Jessica, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, thank you for this uh, this kind invitation to Severo, and also it's a privilege to speak with uh, colleagues such as Teresa and Karim. Thank you to them as well, and particularly to Karim for also introducing the regional context and Sudan in particular. Um, this seminar I think is extremely timely, a very poignant um, timing of the organization of this 10 years on after 2011 and the revolutions of Tunisia and Egypt and the massive wave of social movements that happened around the Mediterranean. And I think the regional context, and I'm quoting Professor Louisa Adris Ait Hamdouche, an Algerian professor and writer who said you know this regional context for democratization is absolutely fundamental and that all the previous waves of democracy um the regional context mattered and having a supportive collective analysis and thinking about this is, is vital to this whether it was uh, south america with the support of the us or asia and japan or spain and portugal with the support of europe what happens in the different countries across north africa is 
is deeply interconnected and it matters how we understand this. Um, in terms of the timeline, it's slightly different for the Algerian context, which you asked me to, to speak to, um, whereas we're 10 years on from these massive revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia. In Algeria, we're now this very week, <laughs> two years on from the, um, the uh, anniversary of the Algerian Hirak movement. This is the huge demonstrations that took place on the 22nd of February 2019, in which millions of Algerians marched in cities across the whole country and led to President Bouteflika standing down and to significant political and societal change in the country. So um, Thomas very kindly introduced us, just right, I've previously worked and, and lived um, in Algeria and then conducted doctoral research with civil society organizations and often very small associations that were working at the grassroots level in very challenging conditions since the 1990s, early 2000s, and published a book on this topic, which I think is also of key importance, the work of those organizations and in difficult conditions and organizations such as the work that Karim's been doing very bravely himself personally, I think is important to understand what happens next and what kind of context we're in today and how what perspectives there might be for the future. So in my brief talk, I'll try to keep to time as well, Thomas. Um, I want to give just a, a brief background uh, to the Algerian context, what happened in 2019, and then bring us up to today, what the situation is this week in particular, and some of the main challenges facing uh, uh, the Algerian people today. So in terms of a background, um, it's Anna Bozzo, who's an Italian academic who published a book on civil society in the Muslim world um, a number of years ago. And she felt after 2011 that we had to recognize that October 1988 in Algeria, where there were significant demonstrations against um, price rises and deteriorating social and economic conditions, particularly for young people, um, which included tragic loss of life, that the ambitious democratic reform process that was put in place after those demonstrations in 1988, despite ultimately its failure, was actually a, a paved the way to a certain extent for the demonstrations that happened in 2011, that this was the Algerian Arab Spring. And she's made that claim as have many other scholars and Algerians themselves, that the Algerian Arab Spring happened in, in 1988. And those of you who know the history and, and politics of Algeria know that then after this very ambitious democratization project that took place, the new constitution, new laws, was followed by uh, the Black Decade in which over 200,000 Algerians lost their lives. Um, when there were multi-party elections, there were very few political parties that were organized enough in the time frame, and the Islamist Front Islamic Dissolut won that election and then the military stepped in and canceled the elections, um, which then led to the, the conflict of the 1990s. Um, when President Bouteflika came to power in the late 1990s, he brought about, he did bring about peace and the reconciliation charter with all its difficulties and critiques. And my colleague who's on the call, Fazir here, has done a very, very impressive research onto this question and can speak with more, um, more legitimacy than me about these questions. But the, the initial stages of Bouteflika's presidency were by many in the population appreciated for the role that he played in, in, in ending the violence. But increasingly his ill health, um, the role of the military, the persistent corruption and the changing of the constitution to prolong uh, the presidential um, mandates were increasingly unbearable for the population. And already by the fourth mandate, um, there was significant repressed protests and frustration and by the fifth mandate in 2019, towards the end of 2018, when people realized that it was most likely that Bouteflika would present himself again for another, another mandate, despite being seriously ill, um, that this was seen as a humiliation to the people, that it was a, a violation of the constitution and that something had to happen. So this then takes us to 2019 and effectively something did happen. And, Algerians didn't accept the situation that was presented to them as seen as a humiliation and, uh, and a violation of the rule of law and their constitution. And in Herat in the east of Algeria on the 16th of February, already mass mobilization and marches took place. Then on the 22nd of February, 
millions of Algerians took to the, took to the streets on Friday and marched despite a ban on, on mobilization in the capital and a history of repression in which many people had lost their lives in previous demonstrations. They took to the, the streets en masse um, in what we've described in a previous article as breaking the wall of fear. They, they no longer feared the repression of, of protest and it was too important that everybody had to march and, and stand up for the rule of law and for democracy in the country. And this phenomenal expression of civic engagement, which was framed by the concept of Selmia, of peaceful protest, which was repeated endlessly throughout the marches, using humor on their banners and, and a reappropriation of the history of Algeria um, with presence of many martyrs for, of um, those who had fought in the Algerian Liberation War, women in particular, marching on the streets alongside young people. And after years of exclusion from political life, young people finally felt that they'd reclaimed politics on the streets of Algiers and in the 48 wilayas, the regions of the country. Um, young people knew the intricacies of the constitution. Um, the songs that they developed in the stadiums and the football stadiums were then transferred onto the streets and became kind of national anthems. And this kind of consciousness that emerged from the grassroots level to all areas of society. There was no one particular uh, contestation. There was not one group of people. It was really a, a protest movement, well, a, a movement which was owned by all in, in, in society and which also brought people together on the claims that they would no longer stand for unaccountable elites with this idea of hogra or disrespect for the citizen by the regime, by the elites was no longer acceptable. The corruptions and a number of high profile cases in recent years and the, and the abuse of na Algerians' natural resources and the significant oil wealth of the country had to end and that the Algeria now had to turn to democracy, to the rule of law, and most importantly, to social justice. So where are we today? So what's the situation today then? And what happened then with this, this movement that began um, primarily on the 22nd of February, 2019? So from that week, followed 54 weeks of marches every single Friday and then Tuesday by students. So everybody marched on a Friday and then Tuesday students took to the streets every single week for 54 weeks. So over a year of peaceful protest on the streets of Algiers and in almost all regions and cities of the country. When the COVID pandemic uh, occurred in March uh, 2020, uh, it wasn't shut down by the government. Indeed, the, the demonstrators chose themselves to stop and there were signs on social media and in windows around the city saying that people should now stay at home and protest at home and for public health and, and safety. And these debates did continue online uh, in these kind of vibrant, often extremely interesting and engaging debates on Zoom now, on Facebook Live, in which different groups in civil society organizations uh, had the Pact Alliance for the for Democracy, NIDA 22, university academics. So whereas the demonstrations uh, obviously didn't couldn't take place on the streets of the country, they the debates and the discussions and the reflections continued online. Now from the regime side, the response um, obviously has been quite different. So following the standing down of Bouteflika in 2019, two presidential elections were cancelled, uh, initially for April and then for July. And finally, on the 12th of December 2019, an election was held in which most of the candidates were claimed to be associated with the former regime and therefore challenged by the people, seen as not responding to what the demands of the Hirak was about. Um, and But President Abdelmajid Tabun was elected on the 12th of December 2019 with a roadmap that he would bring about reform, um, a new constitution, new elections, uh, and a new government. There was extremely low turnout in this election, which was contested by many, many factors in, in society. And during this period, it was became quite clear and transparent that the main leader of the political power was in the hands of, of the army when um, General Gaid Salah more or less took over um, decision-making uh, and oversaw the arrest and imprisoning of a number of 
previous politicians, prime ministers even were, were now in prison. And um, his, his death, the passing of, of uh, General Gagsalain in December 2019, then led to a number of questions as to what would happen next. There has been increasing repression and increasing numbers of political prisoners over the last uh, 12 months and on claims such as um, harming state security, often young people who are arrested for Facebook posts. And by this week now, so the second anniversary of, of this formidable movement, um, there has been increasing frustration and, and contestation both online and uh, now this week, people have gone back to the streets um, to demonstrate. So this week now it becomes particularly important. On the 18th of February, President Tebun, who has himself had COVID and been hospitalized in Germany, becomes deeply problematic for Algerians, given that Bouteflika had been so ill and had been treated abroad when Algerians themselves were struggling to get healthcare. Tebun's speech on the 18th of February announced that the, a number of political prisoners would be released which was widely and very seen as a very positive step forward. Um, number of high profile cases to journalists, such as Khaled Drani and Rashid Nakaz, a political campaigner who'd stood in the, tried to stand in the presidential election. Dalila Twat, who was a union activist. Um, a number of high profile cases and other cases were released uh, from prisons around the country and people waited outside the prisons to, to welcome to welcome their, their family members home. Um, on the 22nd of February, the anniversary, the two year anniversary of the Hirak, thousands of people marched in the different cities of Algeria, despite warnings not to. On the following Tuesday, students marched in the capital uh, in peaceful protests. And from what we can see following social media, uh, there was tension, but there was no violence during these demonstrations. And on Sunday and Saturday, uh, Algerians marched in the diaspora from Montreal, Montreal in Canada to Paris, Place de la République, calling for democracy, calling for a meaningful, peaceful transition. So then lastly, to, to conclude on the, the main challenges or to perhaps bring us towards the, the discussion into what, what happens next, what are the pathways forward, uh, what are the next steps um, for Algerians? Um, and the situation is, is challenging. Like just yesterday, um, um, the new head of the Senate was nominated, um, Gujil, who is 90 years old, we believe. Um, the president himself in his, is in his mid seventies. Uh, the former General Gaid Salah was, was this the generation of the liberation war. So the current, uh, his replacement, Shangriya, is also in his late 80s, 90s, I believe. Um, so the, the challenge, the difficulty of transferring the political space to young people, which is at the forefront of the demonstrations and the marches, has not yet happened. A number of people raised the challenge of what, what about the leaders of the Hirak? If there are no leaders of this movement, does that then raise a problem? And or the fracturing of political parties at the same time, the difficulty for political parties in Algeria and also the need for wide, wide scale change and reform of practices um, across all levels of the administration and, and the institutions. And I want to refer again to Louise Adris Ait Hamdouche, um, who spoke recently just in the last weeks about her visions of what she thinks the perspectives are in terms of dealing with these challenges. And she felt that the, the lack of leaders in the Hirak itself is not, a, is not an issue. We don't look to the Hirak, to the social movement to produce leaders. What we look for is a new political dynamic. And this is now the challenge of the Hirak and the multiple different networks and civil society groups uh, that are on the front line in Algeria. And she suggested that there are three scenarios now that could happen. Um, the first one being a status quo in that, um, with less resources and less legitimacy from its national historical role, the state, the regime could attempt to just maintain exactly the situation as it is. Um, but this would be increasingly difficult to do so given 
oil price fall and, and the, the challenge from the young people who've reclaimed this historical legitimacy um, away from the FLM. The second scenario would be a degradation or a deterioration of the situation, similar to what happened perhaps in Egypt and increasing arrests, uh, repression and torture, which we've sadly seen one case, which is now currently in, in the news. Um, and the third option, she believes the most likely and the most optimistic as well would be a form of transition from the top, looking to what happened in Portugal, Brazil, Spain, um, a form of progressive change in an ordered and negotiated way over time with some aspects that could happen quite quickly, but others and the reform of practice which would need more time to, to take place. But I just want to conclude on, on the very nature of the demonstrations themselves and the peaceful, the peaceful nature of these demonstrations over such a significant period of time and the role of young people who represent over 70% of the population are under 30. Um, and the call for academics in Algeria for, for this kind of transformational change for self-organization at all levels of society, collectivities and municipalities within universities and for these new elites and leaders to engage in a new kind of reform of political culture and a new political dynamic, um, to move away from security discourses which frame Algeria as in a dangerous position or the whole region as dangerous, and which kind of confirms towards a, moves us towards a status quo, which is something that European powers are currently feeding into and Macron's support for Tibun would, would feed that as well, to look at the potential and to see what the opportunities are for meaningful transition and meaningful reform. And I believe as my the colleagues have suggested as well, the, the, the need to look at this at a regional scale is so vital to do that because what happens in, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Sudan, in the neighboring countries in Morocco will be a, an important part of what happens next. So I'll leave it there and I'm very happy to answer any questions and engage in the further discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Uh, I'm actually uh, sort of gonna uh, start where you where you finished, or uh, start with the topic that you were talking about a little bit. That uh, is going to be question for all uh, three of you. So, uh, do we see any organized new political actors and alternatives that are based in the protests, or in general, in case of Egypt? forming up? Do we see any political forces forming up uh, out of the protest movement? Or do we see, in general, any other uh, political parties or actors emerging that could, uh, I would say, satisfy the hunger for change uh, in all three countries that we've been discussing today? So that's, uh, that's my question. Uh, and also, we have uh, two questions from the audience from Fauzia. Uh, the first one is for Karin. Uh, and uh, Fauzia is asking to what extent the horizontal polarization affected the Egyptian experience with transition. So I'm presume he is, uh, uh, I, I presume by this uh, is meant economic diversity or economic polarization between middle class, lower class. And the second question is uh, for Jessica, how do you evaluate the role of a military in the Algerian uh, Iraq uh, movement? And uh, for others that would want to ask questions, uh, feel free to just raise your hand uh, and speak or alternatively, you can, uh, you can just type your question into chat, either private one with me or in general for everybody to see and I'm just going to be taking questions on the rolling basis. Thank you very much. So, uh, Teresa, Karin, Jessica, for the time being, the floor is yours to answer uh, hopefully my question and the question from Fauzia. Do you want to start, Karim? Should I start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, about first question, no, I don't see any potential for any chance, political chances at the moment. I have to mention that the, 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 the recent uh, parliament election 
there was a, a, a opposition uh, a coalition called uh, known as a hope coalition they tried to candidate themselves uh, during the, the the parliament election but unfortunately the egyptian regime arrested all of them and all of them now in the president uh yeah about any appraising will happen in egypt yeah if you follow the news in egypt in 2019 there was in september 2019 and 2020 as well there was like um a spontaneous appraising from the egyptian uh people they gather in the street against uh, against the regime because of the contractor muhammad ali who who already worked with the Egyptian army in several projects in fifth instruments in New Cairo and also 6th of October. And they went because they saw that there is corruption, huge corruption, there is gap between the social uh, classes. So they went to the street and unfortunately the Egyptian regime arrested more than 4,000 of the administrator during these days. About the second question, I see that about the economic, the economic in Egypt is dropped day by day and the fortunate less people are increasing day by day. Uh, there is a huge gap between the social class. There is people are very, very rich. There is people are fortunate less. They don't have even to three meals per day. Um, and I see that this is well, uh, well uh, fire the condition in the next two years, but for, through my point of view, what happened in 2011 will never happen in Egypt again. If there is any trans, the democratic transition will happen in Egypt, will happen through uh, reforms. I mean, yeah, we have to get kind of understanding, acceptance between the opposition and the regime. And the complex now is the Muslim Brotherhood. I think it's very easy between, not very easy, but it's quite easy between the, 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 the seculars and the, the regime to find understanding and find acceptance, but the most brotherhood is are in the middle as a complex. We can't cross it, unfortunately. Thank you, Karim. Uh, Jessica or, or Terka? Uh, um, so, or? yeah, thank you for the question, um, Thomas and, and Fazia. So the first question about organized political forces or parties um, perhaps we can look at political parties and civil society and then government. Um, political parties are in a, in, a, in a difficult place, really. I mean, the, the law was changed in 2011, which opened up the place for the, the sphere for political parties in Algeria, which meant many, many parties were registered. So there's a significant number of parties, but this, to a certain extent, also fractured um, opposition movements. and. There's very little trust, I think, as Theresa also mentioned in the Tunisia case, there's very little trust of political parties by the population who are seen to have exploited the situation or, and then the Islamist movement as well has little trust with the population. Um, there are regional parties with a regional focus so to have a kind of a party based on ideology <coughs> of Algerian nationalism based on an Algerian wide program. Um, this, this isn't, I don't believe that that at the moment is, is, is the situation and therefore parliamentary elections which have just been called will are also contested and challenged because people believe that process needs to happen first to open the political space. Um, nevertheless, I and mean, there are political parties which uh, currently have not been agreed, haven't had their uh, agreement and um, which are also interesting to follow. And there are young people who have joined the new young political parties and that obviously it's difficult for them to access the political space, which is so divided between so many, but increasing involvement of young people in, in the political sphere is, is, I believe, hugely positive and difficult to manage if people don't trust it, but uh, similar problems in every context in the world exist. So political parties still remain a difficult, um, challenging um, sphere in which people can, can, can mobilize, but there are opposition parties in Algeria and, and who are involved in, in the discussions on them right now. The civil society, there are numerous networks, I mentioned the PAD and the NIDA 22, in which different political parties and, and organizations of civil society have come together to discuss, to propose, <coughs> to propose reforms and academics as well. So there are people who are around the table who are discussing right now. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of 
the government, new people came into the government in two years ago, in 2019. And while some people may say these people are co-opted, at the same time, there are different voices. And I believe the, the government now, as it is in Algeria, is a different one than it was in 2018. And it is not one monolithic regime. I believe there are different voices, different actors, and these people may well be able to, to engage with, with the transition, which if we follow what Louisa Jose Amdu said, is the most likely outcome. It will need people who can negotiate on all sides to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. So Fauzia's question about the role of the military in the Hirak, I think the the military and the army in Algeria is, according to most of the surveys and, and the statistics, is the most trusted, one of the most trusted institutions in Algeria. And the historical legitimacy of the army is uncontested. Um, the role of the military in the Hirak, I mean, first of all, I think we have to recognize the fact that 54 weeks of marches were, were conducted in almost all cities of Algeria with very little violence or uh, repression during the first months of the marches. And this was facilitated and, and the general Guide Salah was very much the key actor within within the process that, that took place over 2019 and as much as Algerians may be may be critical uh, the Hirak won on so many points you know they they, they actually they, they got what they wanted what they demanded um, the cancellation of elections the standing down of three major politicians uh, the imprisonment of people on corruption charges and the army was there throughout this process so I think that needs to be re recognized as it is by the opposition actors today. Nobody is saying that the army in Algeria should, should disappear, that the army needs to have its role and the army in itself may well want to actually even stand back from political life, that um, the situation is highly complex for, for everyone involved. But I would be very keen to know what Fauzia thinks uh, the response to that, that, that question would be because she's very well qualified to answer it more, more than myself. But I'll hand the floor over to Teresa. Thank you, thank you, Jessica. Uh, Terko, do you, do you, do you wanna uh, add something? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so this was uh, did follow on my on my uh, on where I sort of uh, finished finished my um, my entry presentation. Uh, so what we what we see in Tunisia in terms of political parties is actually a lot of dissatisfaction with uh, with the current political parties. Uh, so those political parties that were created uh, after 2011 or those who were in opposition to the regime prior to 2011. Uh, and there is, I think, a lot of disconnection uh, from those parties. And we can we can see that, uh, well, first in when we look uh, at opinion polls and at, at how people trust political parties that is going down and also when we look at the uh, at the results of, of different uh, subsequent elections we see how uh, how uh, voters actually stopped voting for parties so for particular parties that were, that were initially pretty strong so we saw uh, Nidatun as being this very uh, very popular anti-Islamist sort of a big coalition project that won election in 2014 and it won just I think less than 10 seats in the in the last elections that happened in 2019. We've seen uh, in Nahda which is the major Islamist or Muslim Democrat party we've seen lo it losing voters and uh, I mean to much lesser extent than the Nidatunis, for example, uh, but still they've been losing voters and now the opinion polls suggest they would lose even, even much more uh, of votes. Um, and, uh, and out of this, we, well, one thing we see a creation of new political parties and, uh, but also entry of new political personalities. And usually this is connected. Uh, so we see uh, people who claim their in sort of opposition to the establishment, who are fresh, who are new, who are, uh, um, who, yeah, who, who understand the people and so on. And, 
and uh, they've been very successful in in uh, especially if, if, we, if we look at the at the last presidential elections for example so three candidates or two candidates that uh, that uh, that made it to the second round uh, Nabil Kerwi and uh, the, the current president uh, uh, Kais Said uh, they're both uh, sort of outsiders or played an outsider card uh, and uh, well, the president is actually a real, real outsider. He did not have any political career, career before that. And he's an interesting case because he's sort of a hopeful case because a lot of, especially young people, I think 37% of young people voted for him in the election. And he eventually got, I think, over 70% of votes in the second round, which shows that, uh, you know, that, that he really conveyed an important message because he was talking really about how the power should go back to the people. And he was talking about decentralization. He was talking about the betterment of economic situation. Uh, the trouble is that president can do very little with those things. He has mostly, so his prerogatives are related mostly to um, uh, to representing the country abroad uh, and not really with dealing with economic issues or proposing reforms on uh, in terms of decentralization uh, and so so we've seen really different different especially personalities and then political parties that created around those new personalities like abir musi and her uh, and her um, political party which which is now in the polls seems to be seems to be very popular which is uh, which is sort of authoritarian uh, you know uh, building on nostalgia for for the for the old regime which comes with the economic hardship especially i think um, so so partially we see uh, you know the, not the old but uh, the current political party is not doing very well and at the same time uh, the occurrence of new personalities, uh, but we also see that a lot of people just don't participate in informal politics. They decide not to go to elections. Uh, they rather voice they uh, voice their discontent through through street and through protest. Uh, we see creation of different social movements uh, around women rights, around transitional justice, uh, and around regional issues. Uh, I just maybe want to say one thing uh, about why, why this is so. Uh, one, last thing, I... one last thing, please. One last thing, okay. Mm. <laughs> 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 Thinking about how to make it short. No, but if, if anyone's into, I, I will stop here, but if anyone is interested, I can, I can speak a bit about uh, what are the reasons for the dissatisfaction uh, with the political parties. Okay, uh, thank you, Teresa. Now we have a set of uh, three questions, I believe. So first of all, I'm going to read the question uh, from chat. Uh, it's from Pelin. Uh, she's asking all three of you, actually, do you observe a change in the cleavage structures? Is there Islamist secularist divide still strong or has it turned more into a divide between pro-democratic and pro authoritarian forces? Which I can guess this question is kind of stemming from the Turkish experience, I suspect. Um, and then we have uh, some raised hands in the audience. The first hand I saw was uh, Viam Melki. Uh, can you please answer your question? It was just for a glimpse, so maybe it was, yes, yes. Hello, uh, can I ask now? Sorry. Yes, yes, you can ask, okay. yes, of course. So hello everyone, thank you so much. This has been really interesting and thanks for the invite. So um, my name is Riem, I'm from Tunisia. I'm currently a development practitioner with Deloitte working on decentralization. And I also have a PhD offer from the University of Warwick, uh, hopefully next year. And my question is for Teresa, actually. Um, I was curious about her take on gender inequality throughout these 10 years. Um, as we can see, um, and especially because I'm really interested in social movements, um, usually we put so much blame on the government and governmental efforts like impl in implementing policies or preventing violence, for example, in terms of gender-based violence or protecting the survivors. But from the other side, this. Um, do you think from your perspective that there's something to blame on the civil movements as well? Because as you see, there's always interruption 
Um, for example, I can think about the Me Too movement in Tunisia. It started like a few years ago and it was disrupted. And every time there is a new incident that dis like um, disrupts this again, and then it fails. So from your perspective, what are the challenges that are facing the social movements uh, in Tunisia themselves? And what can we, I'm not gonna say blame, but what, what can we make improve or make better so that our social movements are more successful or are more uh, responsive to, to, to the government? Thank you. Thank you, VM, uh, for the question and uh... Now, uh, I saw a raised hand from uh, Gordon Crawford. Can you please ask a question now? Good evening, everyone. My name is Gordon. I'm uh, a colleague of Jessica's from Coventry University. Thanks to all three speakers for very interesting and uh, engaging presentations. Uh, my question concerns the uh, the regional dimension which has been emphasized uh, a, a few times but i mean what what strikes me is that the the regional picture since 2011 has been increasingly characterized by differences and diversity rather than similarities um especially in uh in contrast with other sort of earlier democratization waves in Latin America, Central and Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where the, the, the similarities have, uh, have been more evident. So my, my first question is, um, you know, why do you think the regional outlook is, is so important? And, um, you know, what, what justifies this uh, regional emphasis rather than um, a more sort of national outlook. And uh, secondly, why have uh, Tunisia and, and Egypt had such different outcomes despite the, uh, the similar beginnings? And then uh, thirdly, for, for Algeria, um, why have the, the, the Algerian protests come so much later, not until 2019? And does that uh, give the Algerian case uh, a, a greater chance of, um, of successful democratization? And how significant is the peaceful nature of the protests to any success? Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to give space for one more question. So if there is anyone who wishes to ask, a uh, question or have a short comment, uh, please use chat or raise your hand. So I don't see uh, anyone. So uh, Jessica, Teresa, Karim, uh, the floor is yours uh, to answer the questions from our audience. Thank you. If that's the order, then I, I'll take the floor first, if that's okay, Thomas. Um, so the first question then from Pelin about the um, Islamist secularist uh, cleavage and whether that's changed. Um, in the Algerian context, I think this this cleavage would, would already diminish to a certain extent in terms of, or the at least the political place of the Islamist political parties, which in almost all the previous elections has been pretty pretty weak. Um, and I refer to Professor Rashid. Weiss's work and recent um, publications is looking at religion and in, in the whole of the region and he argues where there's there is more religiosity and that people are are more religious there is perhaps there is less of a political influence and therefore more chance or he leaves he finalizes his his, his chapter saying that there's this may well now lead us to a secular to secular societies and I think he has an important point there that this um, I don't believe this divide is still strong. I think we need, it, is, it is there and there are movements such as in Algeria, Rashad and, and individuals who, who, are, are, who would definitely frame themselves in, in those terms. And there have been difficulties in the, in the PAD in this um, pact for an, a democratic alternative member political parties that have left the group because they felt that, that um, other members were, they didn't agree with an is, Islamist um, component of that network 
nevertheless, I think the, the majority of Algerians now are united on, on how they understand the problems facing the country. And this is certainly not something which is going to divide them. And uh, so I, I do believe there is a, yeah, a change, but this is something that's happened over time. Uh, this, the second question, then the regional dimension um, and difference in diversity and similarities, and why is it important then to look at the, at the regional context? Um, I think, I mean, Europe has an important responsibility in this and the, and the, the fortress Europe and the, the wall that exists in the Mediterranean Sea and the difficulties of creating more synergies across the Mediterranean, which do nevertheless exist. And I believe there is a Mediterranean space and that people, people's organizations are moving around this space and learning from each other. Um, I think there are similarities, just listening to Teresa speak, listening to Karine speak, the same challenges are there, the same economic, um, this, or as Professor Paul Rogers has written just very recently, this kind of Tunisia is suffering from 40 years of neoliberal economic policies and all the losers that this system creates. And because Tunisia is an open context right now, it's been far more vocal and people are allowed, are challenging this, this reality on the ground. And this is similarities in Algeria, similarities in the other countries of the region. Um, if there was greater um, exchange of experience, regional solidarity and Mediterranean solidarity and European understanding of what the situation is on the ground in the countries, rather than just supporting the status quo or Macron supporting the Bun, um, real meaningful exchanges, I think this, this would, would necessarily have a supporting um, supportive influence on, on the difficult situation that people are, I'm not calling for interference, but that understanding of, of what the challenges are facing the countries and that this is a process and it's a process that's being managed. And the last question then, why, um, why was Algeria later in 2019? I've referred in the beginning to, to the protests in 1988. Algeria had a very, very difficult experience of the 1990s and a difficult experience of democratization when it was done very quickly. Um, and they've they've learned from that experience, and they've also learned from 2011 and what happened. In 2011, Algeria wasn't in the position uh, that Tunisia was in, and that Egypt was in, and that Syria was in. There, there was not the same level of frustration and um, and repression as well. People were did have free speech and were able to speak. And the situation in 2019 was unbearable for Algerians, and this is what what brought them to the streets to demand change. Um, I do agree. I do think the peaceful ways that Algerians have insisted, and even yesterday, Tuesday, the students marching, insisting, Selmiya, Selmiya, peaceful protest. This is a peaceful protest. And this is the inherent nature of what we're doing. This is a peaceful protest, makes it incredibly hard to repress um, for the, the opposing side. And it means that you can then have a longer process of, of negotiation, of reflection, and and the admiration of this movement means it's it's it has to be taken seriously by the regime. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. you speak from my heart. Uh, this sounds quite conservative regarding the transitions and how it can be done in a longer term if these kind of forces and enticements uh, in form of these protest movements are there. Thank you. I forget. Uh, I forget the order, so I'm I'm claiming my words. There's no order. <laughs> first comes first rules. Capture the flag style. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll start with a with a question from my colleague from Tunisia, and I wish I was quick enough to note her name, but I didn't, uh, as I was so much focusing on a question. Uh, uh, I, her name was uh, Vian Melki. Uh, okay, thank you so much for the question. Uh, and I and I felt VM VM was maybe uh, more informed about uh, about the the social movements around around gender issues than I am. Uh, I will probably sound or I'll take the question from somewhere that I know uh, the best, which is the the situation shortly after two thousand eleven. Uh, and the struggle for the or the struggle, the, the negotiations around the new constitution, in which uh, different women rights organizations uh, and especially some Democrats are very 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 much involved. And 
so I so I cannot really comment on the on the current social movements and what they're doing well or what they're doing wrong because that's not where I did my research. Uh, so I feel more comfortable with uh, with maybe commenting on this. And I I actually. Uh, I actually, it's not that I was surprised, but I think initially when I was doing my research, I underestimated the role of women rights movements in uh, in uh, uh, Tunisia's transition to democracy and in the process of writing the constitution. And uh, and it was throughout uh, studying the process that I understood that they were, that they were really a vital, a vital actor and they pushed very hard for certain issues. Uh, and I think, mostly managed to get what they wanted. Uh, so in those terms, I think they really used all sorts of different tactics, where, whether this was uh, talking to the deputies uh, of, the, of the National Constituent Assembly and trying to persuade them, networking, whether this was protest, whether this was going to different constituencies and working with people in different regions. Uh, so and and doing an information campaign, I think they were they were very vocal on on all those fronts, and uh, and they really I think managed uh, managed to push quite a lot into the constitution in terms of uh, of women's rights, and I, I maybe say that it's interesting because uh, again when when Pelin asked about the about the Islamist secularist cleavage, I think this was uh, very much. Uh, Sort of an obstacle uh, to maybe the negotiations around the constitution and uh, and improving women rights and sort of making a strong case for it for it in the uh, in the in the constitution uh, and but eventually i think it was an important there was an important role played by a coalition of especially women uh, deputies uh, in cooperation with uh, with of course civil society who uh, eventually managed to push through more uh, more progressive uh, wording of the women rights articles into the constitution and the coalition included both and nahda uh, deputies and the deputies for, from leftist uh, and liberal liberal parties um, the second question was <laughs> was a hard one. It was a question about why Egypt and Tunisia had had so different outcomes, uh, uh, even though you know at the beginning the protests looked similar and the situation looked similar in both cases. They managed to the protests led to ousting of dictators of Ben Ali in Tunisia and Mubarak in Egypt uh, quite early in 2011. Uh, and then what we see today is uh, democracy with a lot of flaws uh, in Tunisia and uh, and a lot of, well, and actually I would say a worse authoritarianism in, in, in Egypt uh, under Sisi than it was under, under Mubarak. So what, what led to this? And this is a, there is a huge debate about, about this question. And we all put forward our own theories of why, why this is so. I focus on institutions and on a cooperation between, between dif different segments of the opposition parties. Uh, so uh, that's what I do, but I don't think this is, uh, this is the thing that, uh, that can only explain uh, the differences. Uh, but looking at the, at the institutions, uh, at the beginning, of the differences in institutions. And I look at how inclusive the constitution making was in Tunisia and how less inclusive it was in Egypt. Uh, but at the beginning of that, I see the military, uh, which managed to uh, capture uh, and control a lot of the transition after, after Mubarak fell and was probably behind uh, pushing Mubarak to actually uh, step down from, from his presidency. and. Uh, and and that's I mean we cannot explain everything by by military being a strong actor in Egypt, uh, but I think this is really really important thing to consider. And then of course, and now I'm getting to the last question, which is the regional question, and uh, and then of course there are, there are regional differences uh, and the differences in context when we look at the two countries. And Tunisia uh, was first. 
was sort of marginal, not marginal, I don't want to claim that Tunisia is marginal, but when we look at geopolitics, Tunisia is definitely a less sort of important actor uh, than, than Egypt is. And there was, I think, much, this is not to say that Saudi Arabia and, uh, and uh, uh, United Arab Emirates uh, and other contra-revolutionary forces did not try to play the, their game in Tunisia, but I think they, they were, they, they focused much more on Egypt, uh, and we can see that, for example, in how uh, how CC was offered uh, offered money after uh, after 2013. So how he was offered money from those countries uh, to, to sort of make the economic situation a bit more bearable. Uh, so yeah. Uh, Teresa, thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to give uh, an opportunity to Karin. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to start with question why Egypt and Tunis has the same start and different end. So I'm going to compare briefly between five uh, components. First component is the Egyptian army has a political ambition, but the Tunisian army doesn't have political ambition and has civilian uh, from our Ministry of Defense. Second component is the, the opposition and the leftists and also the labor union is very unique in, 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 in Tunis, but unfortunately we don't have uh, we don't have entity like this in Egypt and yeah we have some syndicates but all of them controlled by the, the inter Egyptian intelligence. Uh, third, uh, third uh, component is the acceptance between the reforms and uh, and the opposition and the revolution leaders. Uh, in Egypt, we had a huge conflict for more than five years. Right now, to be honest, uh, we couldn't find any uh, compromise to solve the condition, specifically with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, Fourth component that Tunisian were very smart when they decided to establishing a commission, uh, a, a supreme commission to achieve the, the, the objective of the revolution in Egypt. We tried to time, but unfortunately we couldn't find acceptance between each other. Uh, last component is Muslim Brotherhood are very pragmatic in, in Tunis and Egypt. Sorry, but they are very stupid. You know, they lost the power very easily. You know, in one year, in one year, less than one year, they lost everything, and we lost the game totally because because of Muslim Brotherhood. They couldn't uh, lead the Egyptians to um, better uh, condition of life. They didn't. Uh, touch the street even, they were talking with themselves. They have never held us over round table. Um, uh, yeah, you can now know why uh, Egypt is still now under uh, totalitarian uh, uh, regime and we will still in more than 10 years. Um, from my point of view, the second, uh, second question about the Islamist and uh, secular, we still have big condition because of the second article of the Egyptian constitute about the identity, the religion identity of Egypt. The second article talking about Egypt is, is a Muslim country, and but now after 2011, there is a huge diversity in the in, in Egypt. We can say that. Yeah, half of Egyptian people are Muslim, but which Muslim? In which sect? Muslim Sufi or Muslim Sunnah or Muslim, uh, uh, just Muslim? There is Christian, which Christian? Which sect? There is Jewish, small uh, group in Egypt. There is atheist, many atheists, many, many atheists in Egypt. And yeah, we, we, we try to tell them that your religion in your heart is not in the constitution because it will not protect you that you are Muslim or you are Christian. And we have to be as a secular country, as all the countries, the, 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 the success countries in the world, it, like in Europe, for example, yeah, if you would like, you have choice. If you want to go to the, to the mosque, go. If you would like to go to the bar, go. It's your decision. Uh, I, I, uh, and about the, the, the region, the region in, 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 in North Africa, Unfortunately, uh, Europe played a very good role in Tunis, but Europe played a very dirty game in Egypt. They bought the interest over the principles, and this made the situation more complicated. I can say during uh, Barack Obama uh, administrative, uh, the US administrative, there was a big pressure uh, over Sisi and over the Supreme Military Council. But during uh, Donald Trump, everything is back to the zero point again. We start from zero. 
so uh, I see, that, and also uh, in, in Tunis, Italy, for example, Spain played a good role because of migration and the Mediterranean. In Egypt, no, because there is huge interest in the Mediterranean about the gas. Any company and the, uh, the Miat company, so um, they didn't want to uh, interaction with the with the the the, the, the situation in Egypt. Uh, I, I, I usually I'm saying that the stability of, of, of Middle East and Europe start from Cairo and the end in Europe, but nobody bought this sentence in their consideration. And uh, uh, Karim, I, 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 uh, Karim, I'm really sorry, but we already uh, we already went uh, past our time, ten minutes. Ah, okay, uh, okay. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was a great event. Uh, actually, I'm very happy that I couldn't get to my questions because that means there was lively discussion. Um, and uh, I would be happy to see you in one of our uh, webinars uh, in upcoming months. Stay tuned. Uh, and hopefully in the future, once the COVID pandemic uh, is behind us somewhat, hopefully we are going to see each other in person in Prague. And after the event, uh, we can hit... Uh, some proper check pop some for some proper uh